Hello. Let's um, learn a little bit about some basic number theory. This uh, lesson is designed to be used in any of the three levels of algebra that I currently teach. Of course, uh, what the students actually are able to do with it might vary slightly from class to class, but it's the beginning of the year. So I want to start with some things that would be important in each class. Uh, sort of the goals and objectives of this lesson is to understand um, some vocabulary and also be able to do some basic procedures related to numbers. And so hopefully at the end of this lesson, students will understand uh, natural numbers, even versus odd, uh, the difference between prime and composite, be able to find uh, greatest common factors or at least common multiples, uh, be able to find the prime factorization of a number, and also evaluate square roots or cube roots. Especially for my um, younger students, the cube roots might be completely new for them. So we'll see how that goes. Um, I actually start with almost an English lesson here because I think in order to fully appreciate mathematics, you really have to understand the difference between abstract and concrete. And so if this were an English class, we might talk about the idea of comparing abstract nouns and concrete nouns. Abstract nouns, um, in a sense, name ideas, qualities, concepts. Whereas concrete nouns name people, places, things. So this is what you might recall from sort of a basic English lesson. In other words, something's concrete if you can experience it um, through your senses. If you can see it, hear it, touch it, taste it, smell it. Whereas if it's something that really only exists in our minds, it's abstract. And so I like to um, talk about this idea that humans use abstract concepts all the time and when I say love or happiness I just sort of assume that you know what I mean and it's not until there's some sort of disagreement or conflict that maybe we actually stop and pause and discuss with each other what, well, what do we really mean by the word love um, also some abstract concepts have a concrete representation that they're you know very much connected with for example it's hard to look at a clock without thinking about time and most people see coins and think about money uh, if I asked you to think about a symbol for love most people would think about sort of you know the little like stylized heart that you often see around Valentine's Day so what is a number? well a number is both abstract and concrete in one sense um, a number, when I talk about numbers as a mathematician, I kind of think of it as an abstract quantity that humans use to count or measure, and then a numeral is a symbol that represents the number. So the numerals are a little more concrete than the number itself. And then, you know, actually looking at four fingers and saying one, two, three, four is extremely concrete. Um, the idea of seven can be represented by different numerals. I mean, here is a seven in sort of a, the traditional numeral that we're used to using. But some of you may recall that you can use VII, and that's Roman numerals for seven. And so where does this numeral version of seven come from? Because this version over here was almost basically just tally marks. Well, this is a Hindu Arabic numeral seven. And if you come over here to my graphic I kind of found for you all, uh, you can see that the Hindu Arabic numerals are, are named Hindu Arabic because they began in India, they spread to the Middle East, and then eventually to Europe. They began in India, you know, well over a thousand years ago, probably over over 1500 years ago. I don't remember for sure off the top of my head. They eventually spread into the Middle East, and then uh, in the vicinity of 800 years ago, um, they started to spread into Europe. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. So this lesson is about basic number theory. So what is number theory? Well, it's all about natural numbers, which is how people learn to count. I mean, it's natural to count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and so on. And so the idea of number theory is just sort of the study of 
patterns and properties of the natural numbers. And you can also extend number theory out to include arithmetic, um, including the four basic operations, fractions, um, zero, negatives. But sort of just the basic idea is to get back to that what we're really concerned with is this lesson is to just sort of patterns and properties of the natural numbers. Worth mentioning, of course, is that where does arithmetic come from? It comes from the Greek word for number, which was arithmos. I may be butchering that since I don't speak Greek. And you know, the idea is that arithmetic, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, is really just different ways of counting. Like divisions counting out groups. Or multiplications like repeatedly counting by a certain number, for example. A little more history for you. Um, humans have a natural number sense. Um, some may only develop to a certain extent, like they, I, they can quickly identify the difference between one object, two objects, three objects, but once you get up to five or seven objects or maybe ten, uh, they would actually have to stop and count. And so unless they live in a culture that has developed counting, um, they might not have as many number words as we do in our language. Um, there are uh, cultures where, for example, they don't really have number words for more than, say, two or three, and they would say that I have many sheep. They wouldn't be able to give you a definite amount. Yet at the same time, they might be aware if one is missing, even if they can't count. And they really think that Sort of the basic idea of that is probably where counting comes from in terms of human history is that um, thousands of years ago when I was a herd, uh, primitive herder, uh, sort of still almost a hunter-gatherer but not quite, um, let's say I had five sheep, even if I can't count to five sheep, I might keep five small uh, stones or pebbles or, or some kind of token or marker and um, I release my sheep and then as I'm rounding them back up at the end of the day I'm, I'm setting the stones aside or putting them in a small leather bag and you know if I've got a stone left I know I've got a sheep I need to go look for and so you know there's no way to know for sure but they think that that's kind of how counting got started in humans um, you know only some cultures would <clears throat> excuse me develop certain types of numbers for example if you don't need a a way of talking about a lack, I don't have any sheep, then you're not going to develop zero. Um, if you don't have debt, you owe me a sheep, then you're not going to have negatives. Uh, parts of a whole, you know, it's it's maybe easier to think about a half a loaf of bread than it is I don't have bread or you owe me bread. Uh, in fact, if you think about um, sort of traditional Western history, the Egyptians had basic fractions like a half and a third, yet it wasn't until um, the late Middle Ages or early Renaissance that Europeans really started to have any sort of use for like zero or negatives. It was basically at the same time that they were absorbing the Hindu Arabic numerals, they also got zero and negatives. And so when you look at sort of this picture here, and we've got some bones that are in the vicinity of 8,000 to 9,000 years old and they have some carvings in them that appear to be like tally marks. So this is one of the oldest known uses of mathematics or counting or numbers by humans. You, it, it's clear that you know humans were doing math before they were ever um, writing. Uh, math is older than written language. And so um, the idea of very, very extremely basic counting is going to record, uh, or excuse me, going to predate recorded history. Um, but number theory is where you really mean it became um, a little more developed with the Greeks because the Greeks had the time and the opportunity to, to notice things about numbers, like that you could sort them into different categories. A little bit more history here because I've mentioned it several times. Uh, this is Fibonacci or Leonardo of Pisa who gets credit 
for introducing Europe to the Hindu Arabic numeral system, which included a positional place value in zero. You can see that when he was roughly alive and he was Italian, the legend is, is that his father was a well-to-do uh, merchant or trader. Um, and when, when the Crusades sort of weren't going on and it was safe to trade with Arabic traders, uh, as a young man, he got quite a bit of experience in North Africa and the Middle East, and uh, I'm sure he wasn't the only one, but he, he realized um, that their system of numbers was far superior. I mean, in Europe at this point, they were still using Roman numerals, and you and I can't really do much with Roman numerals without cheating and converting them to our, our standard numeral system, and then like adding or subtracting or multiplying or whatever, and then converting it back to Roman numerals once we've got the answer. And so... In 1202, he publishes this book, uh, I believe it would be pronounced something like Libra Abachi, maybe, I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that. When I see, I see this word, I think of like library or libro from Spanish, and so I'm pretty sure that's book, and then this reminds me of like abacus, which would be like counting or calculation, and so this book of calculation was basically a textbook to teach other merchants and bankers these methods that he had learned um, from the Arabic traders and this book became fairly standard reading among educated peoples in Europe and uh, without it we probably would would not have developed um, the use of the Hindu Arabic numeral systems nearly as quickly as we did and you know it, within the next few hundred years you had Europeans uh, during the age of exploration and colonialism sort of establishing their culture in the Americas and other parts of Africa and Asia and so on and so forth. And so basically you have this number system that started in India a long, long time ago, spread to the Middle East, spread from the Middle East to Europe, and then Europeans sort of carried it around the world with them. And now most human beings in the world use this number system. It's, it's the primary number system. It's truly a universal language here on earth for the most part so to actually get sort of back into the math here um, one of the most basic ways to sort out the natural numbers is even and odd and you might remember that even is evenly divisible by two and odd leaves a remainder of one or maybe you look at the picture here and you quickly notice well what's different between the odd numbers and the even numbers and think about maybe how we use the word odd in in English. Uh, you might think of it as strange or weird. I like to think of it as sticks out in a crowd. And so what you have with the odd numbers is always one little extra dot sort of sticking out. And so the evens would be 2, 4, 6, 8, 10 because you can evenly divide those up into twos. Odds would be 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and so on because those are always going to have the one little extra left over. Well, I also like to point out to students that you can talk about even and odd just sort of in a more general way. And so what we have here is the pattern or the form of an even number. That if n is some natural number, say 3, and you multiply 2 by 3, you get 6, which we'll all agree is even. But even better, if you count over 1, 2, 3, the third even number is 6. When you put 3 into this, you'll get 6 is the answer, which just so happens to be the third even number. If you put 5 into this, you would say 2 times 5 is 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Hey, 10 just happens to be the fifth even number. What about odd, though? Well, I claim that you multiply by 2 and then subtract 1. So let's put 3 in again. 3 times 3 is 9. 9 minus 1. Excuse me, I did 3 times 3. I apologize. 2 times 3 is 6. 6 minus 1 is 5. And you count over 1, 2, 3. Would you look at that? The third odd number is 5. Put 5 in right here. 2 times 5 is 10. 10 minus 1 is 9. You count over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It just so happens that the fifth odd number is 9. And so now if you needed to know the thousandth odd number, all you would have to do is do 2 times 1,000 is 2,000. 2,000 minus 1 uh, is 1,999. So the 1,000th 
odd number is 1999 and it didn't require that much work for you to be able to do that okay two words here <laughs> that I need you to understand the difference between are factors and divisors excuse me factors and multiples I guess I'm still a little distracted from having to pick up the cat factors another name for that is divisors because they divide evenly into the number for example factors of 12 include 1 2 3 4 6 12 other than 12 these are the numbers that are smaller than 12 that divide evenly into the number whereas multiples of a number can be divided evenly by the original number for example multiples of 3 3 6 9 12 15 18 if you exclude the original 3 that kind of got you started 6 9 12 15 18 and so on are the numbers that are greater than 3 but can be divided by 3 evenly so we're going to kind of <clears throat> pause there and see if we can do some basic problems that you might remember um, from even maybe as early as fourth or fifth grade here let me get my pen set up okay I think I got this right we're going to do the least common multiple of um, 12 and 20 I think this right here is a little distracting. We'll get rid of that. And maybe that. Okay. So, least common multiple of 12 and 20. Well, um, maybe the way you learn to do this in, <clears throat> excuse me, in elementary school is you just start listing multiples of 12 and 20, and you look for a number that appears in both lists. And you know, you start with the smaller number and you just list multiples until you get larger than the second number. And so the next multiple after 12 of 12 would be 24, which happens to be more than 20. So the next multiple of 20 is 40, which gets us back to, well, we need 36, which is still a little less than 40, so 48 which is now more than 40 so the next multiple here is 60 well just so happens the next multiple here if you add 12 more or another 12 is also 60 since 60 appears in both lists the least common multiple of 12 and 20 is 60 quickly say just a little bit about what's the least common multiple multiples tend to be bigger than the number so this is like least means smallest so the idea here is the smallest big number the smallest number that's bigger than both of these numbers but both of these numbers will divide evenly into alright let's try that again and let's do the greatest common factor of 12 and 20. The cat is back. Say hi cat. Say bye cat. Okay. So one way to do this is to maybe just sort of make a little table real quick of, of ways to multiply to 12 and ways to multiply to 20. And then after we get these two tables complete we'll compare them. Well obviously there's 1 and 12. And then there's also 2 and 6. Um, 3 and 4 and as soon as you notice that your numbers have sort of met in the middle you're done the other pairs would be 4 and 3 6 and 2 12 and 1 alright so for 20 we have 1 and 20 2 and 10 3 doesn't go into 20 but 4 does 5 times so we've met in the middle the other pairs would be 5 and 4, 10 and 2, 20 and 1. And so you sort of ask yourself, well, what's the number that appears in both of these lists? And you can fairly quickly identify that it is indeed 4. So the greatest common factor would be 4. 
There's actually another way to do that that um, I do plan to show you later in the video, but we need to go over some of the other vocabulary and concepts first. All right, a natural number p is prime if it has exactly two distinct factors, one and p itself. And again, here p is a variable. We just needed a name for the number, so I picked p. So a quick example of this would be, uh, most of you know that 13 is prime, and the only way to get 13 is 1 times 13. You can't uh, divide any other numbers into 13 other than 1 and 13. However, um, you can have composite numbers, and composite means like uh, made up of parts or something like that. And so not only is 6 1 times 6, but it's a little more interesting. It can also be thought of as 2 times 3. And so now you have that 13 is prime because there's only one sort of boring way to multiply and get 13, whereas 6 has another option. Now to make um, these two definitions make sense, you kind of have to kick out 1 right at the beginning and say that 1 is neither prime nor composite. And I want you to understand why, but I want you to kind of think about that for a second. So maybe, you know, if you're watching this at home, you would pause and think about, okay, well, why would 1 be neither prime nor composite? So I'll give you a chance to do that and think about it, think about it, think about it. Uh, the hint I would give you if you're having a little trouble is to go back to this definition about prime and try to decide um, which of these words are sort of important and what do they mean. And you might eventually hit upon, oh cat, now you've done it. Hit upon the idea that sort of the most important part of this is this word distinct. Distinct means different. And so if you don't exclude one, you would run into the problem that uh, when you check one, it would say one and one itself, and those aren't distinct. And so it's kind of hard to talk about it being prime, but at the same time it's difficult to come up with another multiplication that gets you one besides one times one. And so we kind of have to throw one out as an exclusion to the rule. A little bit more here about the history of prompts, because again, uh, the lesson we're looking at here is one that is good to know some sort of basic history about. Um, we'll do an activity in class about something called the sieve of Aristophanes. And it's an easy way to sort of find prime numbers less than a chosen value. We'll probably do it up to about 200. Aristophanes lived, as you can check out here, in the vicinity of 2,200 years ago, and he was an Alexandrian Greek. He lived in Alexandria, Egypt, but at a time when it was um, heavily under the influence of Greek culture. And so he he's, he's going to get credit for this sieve of Aristophanes, which is a way of finding prime numbers up to a chosen limit. The other sort of thing he's big and, and worth knowing that we'll do a little later in the year is using no modern technology, of course, he fairly accurately estimated the circumference of the Earth. And so, you know, that's pretty impressive considering we're talking about over 2,000 years ago. And he just used a little logic and some math to do that. Um, when we get to the geometry portion of this class, we'll talk a lot more about elements one day. Um, it's a very important book, and um, in it was a proof that it's impossible to find the largest possible prime number. Uh, in other words, there's infinitely many primes, and that result gets attributed to Euclid, who who lived maybe 25 to 100 years, sort of before. Aristophanes, and he was also an Alexandrian Greek, and you know he often gets credit for being like the father of geometry. Uh, but the other uh, pieces of his writing that still exist were also largely about like numbers or number theory. So he had this pretty elegant result about it's impossible to find the largest prime. Um, we may talk a little bit about that in class. Um, So you might care, well, say, why, why should I care about prime numbers? Well, you know, it only took the better part of, oh, we'll call it 2,000 years to come up with a really good use for prime numbers. Um, you 
probably enjoy logging into Facebook or YouTube or something like that or maybe you shop on eBay or Amazon and part of the reason why it's considered safe to do those sorts of things is that in 1977 these three mathematicians um, described what is something that's now known as the RSA algorithm where the RSA is the first initials of their last name and it's the one of the um, ways of securely transmitting information on the internet um, it's what lets you have a password that um, no one else can see it's what lets you send a, a credit card number through the internet so that you can pay for your item and it's based on the idea of really really large prime numbers and you multiply them together sort of the basic idea it's of course a lot more technical than that but that gives you the basic idea and, and it gets into this idea that it's hard of much harder to factor a number than it is to multiply numbers and so it all rests on this really key idea that each composite number has a unique prime factorization it can only be written as a product of primes exactly one way again the word unique here is kind of important because it's the part about exactly one way for example the only way to make six besides you know the kind of boring one times six is two times three there's no other multiplication that will get you six other than three times two but that's the same thing and this idea is so important it's often referred to as the fundamental theorem of arithmetic and uh, that's a really impressive sounding name but it's sort of that just basic idea that when you take six and try to break it apart there's only one possible way to break it apart two times three and so we'll kind of do some um, prime factorizations here real quick um, let me get a new sheet up. Here we go. Um, let's do our prime factorizations in kind of a purple. Why not? And so let's start with 12. Ooh, I don't like that. That's not. Uh, I don't like the size of that. Why is that? But I had a. Sorry about that. I thought I had a way to resize that. That's this doesn't seem. Oh well. Twelve. I'll make do. Well, you might remember doing factor trees, and so three and four. Now, you, maybe you thought two and six first, and that's okay. Your work would look a little different, but you're factor tree would end up being basically the same. 4 is 2 times 2. So the factor tree for 12, you would end up with two twos and a 3. So even if you started at 2 and 6, you would then break the 6 up into a second 2 and a 3. So you would end up with the same things. So here's the prime factorization of 12. 12 is 2 times 2 times 3. Or some of you might even write this with an exponent, 2 squared times 3. Okay, so that's, it's, that's the unique one-of-a-kind prime factorization for 12. Try a slightly larger number, 105. Well, I see 105, and I focus in on the fact that it ends in 5. So I know that it's going to be 5 times something. And I know that 5 times 20 is 100, so this would be 21. And once I break it apart that one time, it's pretty quick to split 21 into 3 and 7. And so this time, my prime factorization is 3 times 5 times 7. And you don't have to write the factors in this order, 3, 5, 7, but it's fairly standard practice to write them in order from smallest to largest. Let's do another one real quick. How about 114? 114 is even. So I know it's 2 times something. Well, half of 100 is 50. Half of 14 is 7. So half of 114 would be 57. And 57, that might be scaring you a little bit. But it's almost 60. And it's 3 away from 60. 
and 3 happens to go into 60, so it would also go into 57. So it would be 3, and if it were 60, it would be 20, but it's 57, so it's 19. And I happen to know that 19 is prime. So the prime factorization here is 2 times 3 times 19. And so here are our three prime factorizations. That's the one of a kind prime factorization for 12, for 105, and 114. So we can kind of pause there and let's go back to our uh, least common multiple GCF problems and let's rework it more in a sense of looking at prime factorizations. Well, if we think about 12, from the moment ago we have that 12 is 2 squared times 2 squared would be 4, so times 3. That's 12. And let's see, 20 would be 4 and 5, but 4 isn't prime, it's two twos. So 20 would be 2 squared times 5. And so you might look at this and say, well, hey, what do these have in common? As factors, well, the greatest common factor here is the 2 squared. And so that's where the 4 comes from. We well, might say, well, how do you do at least common multiple by looking at um, the, the factor trees or the prime factorizations? Well, for at least common multiple, the answer is supposed to be 60. And I'll point out to you the fact that they both have a 2 squared. This one has a 3. This one has a 5. And that would be 2 squared makes 4. 4 times 3 is 12. 12 times 5 is 60. So that's where the 60 comes from. You take, a, you take everything that appears in either factor tree or either prime factorization and you put it all together, multiply it all out, but you only include one copy of anything that's duplicated. The part that's duplicated is the greatest common factor. The least common multiple is, the, is one copy of the duplicated part plus anything that happens to be left. And so that's a different way of finding the least common multiple and the greatest common factor that doesn't really require you to make any lists. You would just have to look at factor trees and prime factorizations. All right, so we're almost done with this lesson. Um, sort of the, the big thing we have left that we'll talk about for the next few minutes. And I included it here just because I wanted to be able to start referring to it from the beginning of the year is the idea of radicals or square roots and cube roots. And so we have the symbol. I prefer it with a little line extended this way. Excuse me. This symbol is called a radical. And honestly, the word in English that it's probably the most related to is radish. Because they, radish and radical both come from a Latin word, which means root. And so you have a plant or a vegetable that's a root. And then you have square roots and cube roots. And the idea of a square root is that if you square some number and get this other number, then the first number is a square root of the second. In other words, 5 squared is 25, so the square root of 25 is 5. And you can extend this out to other powers like third, fourth, fifth. We'll, start, we'll stop with third for now. x cubed is y means that x would be a cube root of y. So since 10 to the third power is 1,000, then the third root of a thousand is ten. This little number right here is called the index, and we'll talk about it more in a lesson we do later in the year about radicals, but for right now, you don't see an index if it's a square root, if it's anything other than a square root, you have to see a little index there. And for us right now, it would be uh, cube roots or third roots that evaluate nicely. So on the, the notes page, you should be filling out as you watch this video, there's a table that looks something like this. Um, it's got three columns. We'll just go some basic old black here. And it says um, n, n squared, n cubed, 
and it's just got three columns and the part that's filled in for you is just sort of the natural numbers plus zero or the natural numbers and zero and you're supposed to just go down these columns and if you need the help of a calculator I won't, I'll forgive you but you square zero it's zero you cube zero it's still zero one's also pretty boring two is where it starts to get a little more interesting two squared is four um, two to the third would be two times two times two which would make eight it's four times two is eight three squared is nine nine times three is twenty seven four squared is sixteen four times sixteen is sixty four and so I'll just have you fill this table all the way out um, I believe it goes down to about 15 and then I'll throw in some reference numbers like 20 and 50 and 100 that are fairly easy to do without a calculator I'll be honest with you I can I can list squares up to probably about 15 pretty quickly um, I've got those memorized you should have memorized to at least 12 and so you should know 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, if that was up through 6, 7 is 49, 64, 81, 100, 121, 144. You should know through at least about that far as perfect squares. If you can add in that 13 is 169, 14 is 196, 15 is 225, you're doing great. 20 you should also be able to do because it's kind of an easy number. 2 squared is 4. So 20 is 400. So if you're looking at something more than 400, then you're looking at a square root that's uh, more than 20. Cubes are a little harder. I probably can do cubes up to maybe 8. The ones that you really need to know are like 2 cubed is 8, 3 is cubed is 27, 4 cubed it's nice to know is 64, 5 cubed it's nice to know is 125. And then after that, I might even have to stop and think about the, the next ones are 216 and uh, 343 and let's see 8 I would have to stop I think it would be 512 so you know you fill out the table just so you have something to refer to so that we can do problems like this from the beginning of the year we want to be able to you know take our problem um, let's do Oh, I don't think I've used green yet. Let's use this darker green. You know, I want to be able to do from the beginning of the year problems like square root of 49, and you'll be able to tell me that's 7 because 7 squared is 49. But then I want to push you just a little bit. And so maybe I, if I threw this at you without really doing this lesson, you might say, Mr. Herman, I have no clue how to do that. I don't like fractions that much, so why are you going to throw a square root of a fraction at me? And I'd stop you and I'd say, but hey, do you know how to do the square root of 9? Yeah, 3. Hey, do you know how to do the square root of 16? Uh, that's 4. And so I try to get you to realize that as long as the fraction's a kind of a nice fraction where both the numerator and denominator are perfect squares, it's still pretty easy to do the square root. 3 fourths times another 3 fourths would be 9 over 16. Okay, and it's part of the reasons why this work or doing a little more, more with this we'll get into later in the year but for right now I just kind of want you to know that if it's a nice fraction in the sense of both perfect squares you can do the square root and then I sort of throw this one at you and see what you can do with this and the hope would be that after a, a minute or two of looking at it working with it somebody would look at me and say Mr. Carpenter I don't think that one's possible And we would talk about, you know, the signs. Hey, um, well, positive 2 times positive 2 is positive 4, and negative 2 times negative 2 is negative 4. No, no, it's not. Wait a minute, it is positive 4 again. And so we would eventually decide that the only way we can think of getting this is to multiply positive 2 and negative 2, and that's not multiplying a number by itself, so that's cheating. And so, you know, I'd be great if you realize it's not possible. Uh, and then later on, we'll be talking a little bit more about this. I would say the best answer here that will lead into one of our next lessons is for you to answer that this is not a real number.
okay not a real number and then I would say okay well let's do some basic cube roots real quick like third root of eight and you'd use your table or a little bit of basic arithmetic and you'd say well that's going to be two two times two times two three copies of two multiplied together to get you eight or a third root of 125 and maybe you would check your table or whatever and you decide that's five because five times five is 25 and then five times that or five quarters like with money would be a dollar and 25 cents so it'd be 125 and then you know I got this one on here just sort of to mess with you a little bit more even so than the one above it so I want you to go ahead and run and say, well, that's not possible either, Mr. Carpenter. It's still a negative underneath the radical. And I'd say, well, not, not so fast. What about negative 2 times itself three times? Well, negative times negative is positive. That would be positive 4, but then 4 times negative 2 would make negative 8. And so I would point out sort of a big deal here is that if you've got an odd root, you can do a negative. But if you've got an even root, you can't do the negative. And so that kind of ties together how even and odds even related to these uh, square roots and cube roots business. And so thank you for your time. That is the end of our show.